Those of you joining us, please mute your microphones. Please mute your microphones. We'll be getting started shortly here. Uh, we just still have a few people that are not muted. If you could please take a quick look at your microphones, make sure you're muted. Give it uh, maybe one more minute here, Iris. I see a few other people signing in here. Yeah. Those of you just signing in, if you would please mute your microphones. Right. Well, what do you think, Iris? Go ahead and uh, we'll get it started. Yes, let's do it. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Johnny Kerwin, and I'm the trail administrator for the Washington Rochambeau Revolutionary Route National Historic Trail. We are uh, joined tonight for as part of her monthly lecture series by Dr. Iris DeRoe. And uh, just a little bit about Dr. Iris de Rode, she is specialized in the French participation in the American Revolution, more broadly in the history of the Atlantic Revolutions. She earned her doctorate degree in November 2019 with a PhD from the University of Paris. For her dissertation, she earned 13 fellowships, including grants from the Richard Lunsbury Foundation, Mount Vernon, Monticello, the French Embassy in the Netherlands, and the French government. She has presented her research at 25 international conferences, such as those organized by European Early American Studies Association, the French Association of American Studies, Brown University, Stanford University, Mount Vernon, and Monticello. Her dissertation will be published in French in the autumn of 2021, entitled Paris Honoré Champion. Iris is currently working on the publication of an adaptation of this dissertation in English to be published in 2023 with the University of Virginia Press. In addition, she is also working on her documentary film entitled En Route for Revolution, based on her research for the French company Gideon Programs. Since 2013, she has served as an adjunct faculty member and Iris has been teaching several classes in American and transatlantic history and international history and also on a, a more personal note she has been working a lot with the Washington Rochambeau National Historic Trail with helping us with in a variety of areas with uh, historical research planning and also an upcoming travel lab so we're really honored to have her here with us tonight I know it's late for her in France so we appreciate her tuning in and doing this for us and, and all of you who are also joining us from France tonight as well. So without further ado, uh, Iris, take it away. So thank you very much, Johnny, for this lovely introduction and for, for another lecture today. Um, so I just wanted to remind those who, who were already here last time um, during the last two lectures, now this is the third of the series, um, just remind you what I did last time a little bit, and then we'll go through the, the lecture of today, which is called Reflections on Attacking New York. So what I want to address today is especially the, what I would say, well-informed, realistic, but especially lengthy decision-making process uh, that was made by General Washington and Rochambeau together throughout the, the winter, but especially spring of 1781, leading, of course, to the Yorktown campaign. 
because um, in history books, this decision-making process has been considered going from June 1781 until September 1781. But looking at new archives, I would argue that actually this decision-making process was way longer. It actually already started in July of 1780, so almost a year before uh, this planning was being organized. And so what I said, especially less um, during the last lecture is that uh, this was especially already starting in the winter of 1780 and 81. And we remember that I was looking at these reconnaissance tours that were organized by Châtelieu, so François-Jean de Châtelieu, the major general of the French, uh, together with a few French officers, but also American officers in a joint mission to understand the war they were in. So they were not only looking at the tactics and the military possibilities, they were also looking at politics, at culture, at um, the landscapes, all these different factors to include in the, the, their study of war, which is, can be considered as uh, the military enlightenment. So that was what I was saying last time about this military enlightenment being really applied to the American theater of war by these Frenchmen together with the Americans. And we'll see especially that that would continue even more during the period of, um, try to put another slide, March, August, 1781. Uh, so the period of the spring leading to the Yorktown campaign is where I'll focus on today. Um, so I'll start with a, sort of a fun anecdote about George Washington, and then I'll move on to the campaign that was organized by especially Rochambeau and uh, Washington and those working for them, their staff, um, leading to a, a very interesting report that is stayed unpublished that I found in the Châtelieu archives. And so Châtelieu archives is of course where I based my research on my dissertation and especially the book that I'm writing now. Um, so let's start. So at the beginning of March 1781, George Washington was received in splendor in Newport, Rhode Island, so where the French were encamped for about almost eight months, if my calculation is right, but they were, of course, there since July 1780. Um, and so the first time that Washington was actually coming to Newport was on March the 6th. He wanted, of course, to visit his French allies. He wanted to discuss the possibilities of their next campaign, of which, of course, they already had started to work since uh, September. So the Hartford Conference of 1780, which I have discussed during, I think, the first lecture. Um, so here they were discussing, are we going to attack New York, where the British are based, or are we going to another campaign in the South? So this was something that still had to be discussed. And so he came to Rochambeau. Uh, and the French army to, to observe what could be done together. And so when he was arrived, when he arrived um, in the early morning on March 6th on the docks of Newport, Rochambeau and Châtelieu, but also other French officers, received him on board of their impressive flagship called Le Duc de Bourgogne. After this, they went ashore where a large cheering crowd was welcoming them from the population of Newport, but especially of the French soldiers that were uh, exposed there with uh, two large rows of about 5,500 men that were lined down in sort of a double rank on both sides of the Newport streets. So as you imagine this very impressive welcome of all these French officers and especially the soldiers in their splendid uniforms uh, that they of course had brought from France and that were not that common in America at the time. And so this entire French fleet uh, that was lay, that laid in the in the port of Newport um, was firing salutes, um, and so there was this, this sort of show with lots of smoke. And one of the people that was there, so the uh, he's called John Williams um, from uh, from Newport, said, "I never felt the solid earth tremble under me before. The firing from the French ships that lined the harbor was tremendous. It was one continued roar, and it looked as though the very bay was on fire." And so the attitudes of the French nobles, their deep obedience, so this is about discipline of the army, the lifting of hats and caps, the waving of, this, of their standards, and especially the sea of plumes, of course, on their, um, on their uh, heads. The long line of the soldiers and the general disposition of their arms was unique to us. So it's an interesting testimony because it shows this display of the, the French army, their their organization, their uniforms. And so, of course, it's quite a, a stark contrast to what uh, the Continental Army of George Washington looked like at the time. 
It was also important to show that there was mutual trust between the two allies, so the French and the Americans, would show that they were united, they were together, they were ready for their new fight and their new campaigning season, which was kind of starting in March already. It was also, of course, necessary for the local population to show this alliance to, to be able to work, because, of course, as we remember from the last lecture, there were quite some pre prejudices circulating against the French, against them being effeminate, effeminate frog eaters, or even being um, sent by the Pope as a Catholic mission. And so after this particular spectacular welcome, uh, the party of Rochambeau and all the officers, and especially George Washington, went to the State House, where Washington was received officially, and after that they went to the Old Vernon House, which you can both see on the slides. Um, so they had a long and beautiful supper here, and then uh, they, they would continue on the dark uh, streets where the whole town was illuminated by uh, candle lights to welcome the French-American army again. Um, so just, of course, uh, at the same time, during uh, the, the day after, March the 8th, uh, the third day when Washington was there, Châteauneuf himself was preparing a special dinner. He invited Washington over to his home called the Maltzley House, which is still standing in Newport. And so he would organize this great dinner for him with actually 50 people that were invited, amongst whom uh, Knox, Schuyler, Hamilton, but also Rochambeau and the Vieux brothers and local inhabitants of Newport uh, that were mainly merchants and traders and some of the beautiful women of the town to organize all together this dinner. And this is not just an anecdote. These kind of dinners were organized sort of st strategically because the Allied wanted to cement their alliance and show uh, their new friendships and their new trust that they had one in another after this winter of cooperation together. Um, and so Châteauroux, just this is some information that I have from letters that he sent to his sister. He had the best silver for the occasions. Yeah, and he'd actually even brought his silver from France. He had best he had brought the best Bordeaux wine, which was very rare at the time, of course, in the United States. Um, and he was especially wearing his new dark blue jacket with golden epaulets and buttons over his bright red shirt and trousers that his sister had just sent him from Paris that was made by the same um, same tailor as the, the one of Marquis de Lafayette. So Marquis de Lafayette's tailor had made that for him. So he looked fantastic during this whole dinner. And even across the Atlantic, people would later talk of this splendid dinner organized for George Washington. This was, of course, quite beneficial for Châteauroux's reputation to have had Washington at his own table. And of course, beside all these sparkling fun activities, here, by the way, this is the Maudsley House today, which is uh, still quite similar to what it looked like during this dinner. And of course, since we are here in a part in lecture series on the W3R, so the Washington Rochambeau Revolutionary Route, all these buildings still exist. So the State House on the right, and then in the middle, you can see the Vernon, Vernon House of Rochambeau, and on the left, the Maudsley House of Châteauroux. Um, but so, of course, these are fun anecdotes because actually, the gentlemen were working. They were discussing their next campaign. And so this situation was as follows. You had General Clinton, the British General Clinton, was occupying New York. And then in the south, the Major General Phillips was active there. He had just captured Savannah and Charleston and became a dangerous front. So there were two fronts where the French and Americans had to deal with. And Washington, of course, was still eager, as he had already expressed a few months before during the other conference, the Hartford Conference, um, that he was eager to recapture New York City. However, both Rochambeau and Washington still did not really know how many people they had at their disposal, how many soldiers, how much naval assistance would come, if they would have more financial help. So still, this was a big problem because this monetary aid and especially the aid of more troops was crucial because the British were uh, completely outnumbering the French American army. Um, and so they could not make this decision yet of the real attack, but Washington had a request to Rochambeau. He asked him to help uh, the Marquis de Lafayette, who was based in the South, to capture the traitor Benedict Arnold in Virginia, who after his, what he would say, black treachery, served now as a brigadier general in this army of Major General Phillips, who was ravaging, let's say, in the South. And so Lafayette had only a small army and really needed reinforcements. 
And so Washington requested uh, a fleet of the French with a few soldiers to be brought to where he was at the Chesapeake Bay. And so um, here we can see an engraving of this moment because the French, uh, the French sailed away and so to this English fleet, but the British Vice Admiral, <laughs> complicated name to pronounce, Arbuthnot, he sailed faster than the French fleet. And so he arrived a little earlier, creating an advantage for him. And so there was a, a battle, the Battle of Cape Henry on 16th of March, as you can see on the, on the slide too. But unfortunately, there was a, it was a, a dangerous, hard fought battle. However, there was no real advantage, but most ships were severely damaged. And so uh, the English pulled out of the Chesapeake Bay and the Touche, that's the French Admiral, was forced to return to Newport. And someone who was there, De Pont, so Guillaume de De Pont, he described that the fight was a sharp one, well conducted and reflected credit on the French Navy. But the object failed and glory is only a chimera when it does not offer practical results. However, this was not the most, the result they had hoped for, they didn't win, but they could actually also observe this Chesapeake Bay that was already on their radar since the beginning of the campaign where they thought of maybe gonna attack that part of, of the continent. And so Chesapeake Bay and the surrounding lands, um, they could observe that it was very easy to get in with the fleet and block that bay. So this was interesting information that already, of course, Chateau had all, also already gathered in the winter, but now they had additional intelligence on this very important, or at least would be very important uh, spot. Um, and so, of course, during this battle, Washington had already gone home uh, to, to his own headquarters. Um, and so again, there, the, the problem became again that they didn't have enough men, they didn't have enough of the fleet and nor money. And so they had to wait for reinforcement. They waited for the Congress to, to tell them what they would, could send, but they would especially wait for Versailles, so Louis the 16th court, who would explain to him, uh, to, who would finally have to say what he would send. Um, this long period of waiting became very complicated, of course, for those who were in the war, because it was just very frustrating, as you can see in lots of letters back and forth on how complicated it was to just wait. But finally, mid-April, uh, La Luzerne, who is on the right of the slide, so that's the ambassador, the French ambassador who served in Philadelphia, he received the news first. Most of the time you can read that in mid-May, uh, Rochambeau received it, but he already received it uh, at the time through a letter of Vergen, the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And so he announced that the second division, so this is a group of 2,000 soldiers that was supposed to be sent to America from France, would not be sent by the French king because he was afraid that in response, the English would also send their army uh, or additional troops and that they would even outnumber them more. So instead he decided to send money. He sent 6 million livres uh, for a next uh, delivery. And especially what was most important, he would send de Grasse. So that's the admiral that you can see on the left, who was um, supposed to come with a very large fleet of 20 vessels. And this was extremely important because of course the British Navy was blocking lots of parts and was uh, very, um, well, it was like a mighty Navy was, was uh, very dangerous for the French because they didn't have enough ships and the um, Continental Army did not have a fleet. So they really needed desperately this fleet. And he would come, they said, during summer. What he would do is he would come from, uh, from the West Indies have 20 vessels with him, so large warships, and he would come to uh, Washington Rochambeau for a joint operation on land and on sea. However, this uh, information had to stay secret uh, from De Grasse, and uh, I mean, this, the information of De Grasse had to be secret from, uh, from Washington and the Continental Army, because it, uh, Vergen, so the minister who wrote this, was afraid that this would leak. But as we will see, in Luzerne, his papers, you can read that he actually asked Châteauroux to give the information to Washington. So Châteauroux wrote letters to Washington and also even had some secret meetings where he would explain that De Grasse, the fleet, would actually arrive and come to America at eight. Um, but so Luzerne writes to Châteauroux, uh, in this, this is an unpublished correspondence that's held in the Châteauroux castle. He says, we now recognize the unsurmountable difficulty of attacking New York. Another operation would be highly applauded. 
So he writes this based on the fact that there are way less people coming than they would expect. And then he said, there are some people who believe that we should sacrifice everything for this attack, New York, a much more important number judges this as madness. Um, so he's referring mainly to people in Congress, the people he's saying, he spoke to different delegates from different states, and he says that it's just mad to want to uh, attack New York with the manpower that they have at their disposal. So it's already the beginning of April. And so based on this new information, Rochambeau wants to talk to Washington, of course. He wants to organize a new conference with him, which will be held uh, in May. Um, on the 21st and 22nd of May. Um, and so I have to go through the notes, here we go. So they chose Weathersfield uh, in Connecticut as their meeting point because it was in between their two encampments. And so they met at the still existing Joseph Webb House that we will see later in the slides, but they, they met uh, in May to discuss the new possibilities since finally the news had arrived on uh, the fact that the fleet would arrive and more money and a few uh, people with the fleet. Um, and so in the early morning of this meeting, Washington received a secret letter from Chateauneuf. He said to him, having employed my thought upon the road, I imagined a plan that I, do, that I now submit to your excellency. So he had made this plan based on his rec reconnaissance tours that he had done during the previous winter. He made a very large plan explaining um, that the whole fleet would sail directly for the Chesapeake Bay and then whilst we march by land to proceed to the bay. So he kind of set the whole plan for the southern campaign, so the campaign to the Chesapeake Bay in this letter and asked Washington uh, to propose it as a sudden and newborn thought during his talks with Rochambeau. So this is a secret letter that, um, that has been published later, but it, it's been also kind of a contro controversy because he also burned a few of these letters. He's asking to keep them secret and they would discuss about these new plans. But we'll see also that during the actual uh, Weathersfield conference here, oh yeah, I just wanted to show that there is another place we can visit even today on the W3R, which is where he wrote this letter in the White Tavern. So the secret letter to George Washington was written here in what's now called Endover, the Daniel White Tavern. And so in the Joseph Webb House, uh, Chateau came to translate for Rochambeau and Washington who would discuss their new possibilities. And so Rochambeau explains uh, his plans, which is the, this, let's say, Southern campaign that they had uh, prepared during winter on how to remove all the troops to the South and, and create a sort of a big uh, siege and battle uh, in the South. Um, which is also still to be visited today in Weathersfield. And so during this the meeting, um, the Southern operation was discussed and Washington was listening carefully. He said um, that he promised to extend our views southward as circumstances and naval superiority might render more necessary and eligible than he would actually want. However, he still strongly hoped that it were possible to retake New York. He knew that this fleet of the Gras would come, but he was still hoping for extra troops from different states for him in the Continental Army and the militia. And so he wanted this one great and decisive stroke. The enemy may be expelled from the continent and the independence of America established if they would go for New York. He did not believe that that effect could be achieved by going to the South. But still this new information had come, but he could not make the final decision. So they did agree upon to bring the French and American troops together close to New York as soon as possible. They would take the decision of attacking New York or the Chesapeake Bay when they would be in New York. So they would base this on the new number of troops, but also on a new reconnaissance mission that they would organize together. And so um, we can also see that in the meantime, Rochambeau was writing to de Grasse. He said that there would be two options, Chesapeake or New York. And he also says that uh, winds would make you prefer to go to the Chesapeake Bay and it will be there where we think you may be able to render the greatest service. Um, and so contrary to what has been written by quite a few historians is that uh, Rochambeau is manipulating this plan or like pushing it through it with Washington. He was dis discussing this with Washington too. He said it's, it's very essential that you inform Washington on what you do, de Grasse, but he also, as we have seen during the, the conversations and, and in other letters, you can see that they're both 
as from the beginning, considering both options. The only problem is that they just don't know if it's possible. So that's why they go to New York. Now they will go close to New York. So we can see that in late June, Rochambeau is going to organize the, the big um, tour, the, the, the walk, let's say the march to New York from, from Rhode Island. They would go to a place called Phillipsburg and so walk down. Um, and so we, again, they don't know where they're going next, but they do know that they want to join with the American army to start something. So they will still make that decision, but they especially need more information as we have seen throughout the winter too. Um, and so uh, at the end of June, they would start this, this walk. And so the logistics and organization, or sorry, it's, it's more mid-June. So the logistics and organization, of course, were quite impressive because they had to move 5,000 uh, French soldiers over this long distance on foot. Um, so they had to, to buy horses and oxes. They had to inspect all the roads. They had to build bridges. They had to build especially ovens to bake bread. You have to think of this huge organization to transport and to organize such a big move. And so after almost three weeks of traveling, on July 6th, the French finally saw George Washington um, in what's now West, West Chester County in New York. And Washington had about 4,000 troops stationed there. And so when the American general, Washington, inspected the French troops, they appeared to him in all their splendor again. And he was deeply impressed, uh, just like in March in Newport. Um, but Rochambeau also inspected Washington's troops and he was quite surprised and even it was quite painful for him to see, according to Von Klosen, who wrote a diary about this episode, who says, these brave men are almost naked with only some trousers and little linen jackets. Most of them are even without stockings. But he continued, would you believe it? They were still very cheerful and healthy in appearance. Um, and so in, in most of these testimonies of fr some French officers, they would always comment on the fact that the Americans did not have that much as, as uniforms or arms or um, payments and, and training, but they had a real will to fight and they were happy and cheerful to be, for, to be fighting for the cause. You can see throughout the, um, the testimonies. And so uh, the French and Americans would, would camp uh, quite close to New York now. And um, Rochambeau would take his uh, headquarters in, in the place you can see on this slide, the Odell House, which is also still uh, almost to be visited um, along the W3R route. Um, so it's under restoration today by the French of the Odell House. Uh, and it's a, it's a big project to make this home uh, to be sort of a museum again, and especially in order to, to, to have a memory of this important moment for the Yorktown campaign, because this is where Rochambeau and Washington, and especially also Châtelieu, were planning a new mission. This mission has stayed quite uh, understudied, mainly because there's not that many sources on them. People or historians have studied this specific reconnaissance in force mission, but in the Châtelieu archive, there's a very important document that shows why this is such a crucial um, yeah, mission that was held from the 21st to 23rd of July. And so as we remember, um, the French and Americans, so this little group of people had been doing lots of research on uh, the possibilities for the next attacks during the winter of 1781, but one point had not been studied yet, which was New York, because of course this was occupied by the British. And so it was very hard to perform this reconnaissance on. Uh, Châtelieu commented that it was infested by Tories and so they could not go. And so it was essential for them to study the whole, uh, yeah, the whole area of, of New York um, to see where the British were based, what their forces were, what they were doing there. And so they organized what's called the Reconnaissance in Force mission. And so they wanted to understand the layout, especially of the British fortifications, and if it were possible to maybe attack this. And so they adopted this European military tactic that used a simulated assault of, on the enemy's fortifications in order to draw them to fire. So when they would fire, you could, you could find where they were located. So it would expose their strength, but also their location. And after this test, the French and Americans together would uh, withdraw and, and just, uh, yeah, go back. Um, and so they started this on the 21st of July. And so the British defensive system uh, it, north of Manhattan uh, was being observed at the beginning. 
so Washington and Rochebeau sent 4,000 French and American soldiers together to march towards Manhattan over bad roads and in the pitch black night um, to survey the northern line of the British defenses, which is from the west at Kingsbridge to the east along the Harlem River uh, to Long Island Sound. Um, and so these troops were divided in, in uh, four major columns, and so they were all commanded by different, um, different generals. Um, and so the Allied army tested how far they could go. They observed possible crossing and landing sites for the invading force that they could maybe be later. And they especially, of course, looked for vulnerable points in the British defense system, and they watched for their enemies' movements. And so at the break of day, so this was happening during the night, and so during the day, bomb the British, of course, react. They send their Hessian Jaegers to open fire on the Franco-American skirmishers. They also send light dragoons uh, to, to, on, on ferries across the Harlem River to oppose the French and American forces. And in the meantime, Washington and Rochambeau managed to go even further to, to observe the enemy's position further down the road, while Chateau was in command of the army near Kingsbridge to observe the surroundings. And so this whole action lasted for three days and uh, the French and American allies were making observations, maps, uh, calculations, and of course they were avoiding the real danger of attacks and an actual battle. And so they went back to Dobbs Ferry. And here, uh, the, and also in actually in the Odell house, uh, Chatelieu and his officers together with Rochambeau were writing a report. And this report uh, has been uh, hidden for almost 250, no, 40 years <laughs> um, in this Chateau de Chatelieu that I, of course, have already discussed. And so this is the document, it's called Reflexion sur l'attaque de New York. Uh, so this is written just after this specific reconnaissance mission. And in it, in about 40 pages, Chatelieu writes about every possible attack that was um, to be done, maybe in New York. And so um, he, he says, he talks about what's called the general dispositions of the attack that we could do. And then he would detail all these specific attacks. And so this report shows a plan based on a siege of the city of New York and a combination of five different fronts created around the city. And so it would be, he says, advantage, advent, I can say this word now, uh, uh, it would be an advantage to create the five attacks simultaneously on the northern part of the island of New York, the works of Long Island, and um, those of the peak of Paulus Hook on Staten Island and on the tip of the Sandy Hook. So these are five different points. Simultaneous attack had to be organized. However, he says, it is not doubtful that if these five attacks were performed together and with vigor as well as supported and assured by a number of sufficient troops, we could eventually promise a success. But it must be admitted that they would require much superior means than those we can actually dispose of. So he says, the enemy could make our best hopes vanish in an instant. So New York is too hard to attack. It is too dangerous. The French and Americans just don't have enough manpower. So it seemed that New York was invulnerable and Chatelieu explains this in many different pages in great, great detail. And so, of course, this news arrives at Washington. George Washington, of course, was there. He was present during the reconnaissance tour and could make his own conclusions. But of course, he also heard about the conclusions of the French. And so while listening to this and, and uh, making, again, his own ideas about it, he wrote in his own diary on August 1st, everything would have been in perfect readiness to commence an operation against New York if the states had furnished their quota of men. I could scarcely see a ground upon which to continue my preparations against New York. Therefore, I turned my views more seriously than ever before to an operation south. And so he also ordered his superintendent, Robert Morris, uh, to start organizing transportation, payments and provisions to, for this allied army to, um, to go to organize this new mission. He says, matters having come to a crisis. I was obliged to give up all idea of attacking New York. And Chateau writes to his sister at the same time, if my Lord, so Cornwallis forgot himself a little in this country, we can rather surely take him or force him to flee 
by land while losing the biggest part of his troops. So he really believed it could work. Lots of conferences with Washington were needed before deciding on going to Yorktown, for whom I've always served as an interpreter. So we can see here the function of Chateau as being sort of this liaison officer between Washington and Rochambeau. But what I would say is more interesting is that they base the decision on the reconnaissance tour, but also on the realistic situation in which they just don't have enough men. And so in the meantime, um, for more than 10 weeks, the Marquis de Lafayette had been chasing the Lord Cornwallis in Virginia. Um, and so the British general, Cornwallis, had received orders to set up a permanent supply base in Yorktown, next to the Chesapeake Bay in early August. And troops began fortifying the town as well as Gloucester Point on the opposite shore of the York River. And the French, because of their observations, knew that what the British saw as a strategic point would actually become a mortal trap if the French and Americans could block the peninsula of Yorktown and if the British fleet could be prevented from entering the Chesapeake Bay. And so contrary to the situation in New York, here the French and American army could actually outnumber the British. You could see that the Rochambeau de Barrao is from, New York, from Newport with his fleet, de Grasse with the new fleet and the troops of George Washington could outnumber the British. And so victory was possible. But of course, the problem was still to guarantee the success of this battle, ships were needed. As we said, as I just said, the Chesapeake Bay had to be blocked. And so the main information that had to arrive still was where was the Grasse? Where was he supposed to go and when would he arrive? Um, you have to imagine everything is going by, of course, letters. So everything took a long time. And so finally, two, eight, two weeks after this decision in Washington's mind, he can receive, he received the confirmation. Uh, so the Grasse would arrive, he said in a letter, with 24 ships of the line, four frigates filled with siege material cannons, but especially 1.2 million livres money, um, which he had borrowed actually from Spanish banker in Havana, uh, so in Cuba. And so de Grasse also got 4,000 extra soldiers with him, which is essential for, of course, their, their final victory. Um, and so uh, another fleet, which was still based in Newport, would also bring um, more material. And then would um, uh, the Virginia militia, of, so for George Washington, other troops would also come. So we could hear finally everything sort of came together and it was possible to do this new campaign. Um, and so, okay, this was it. So uh, contrary to most historical accounts, uh, August the 14th, 1781 was not the moment in which the allied commanders made the ultimate decision to finally go to Chesapeake Bay. I would see it more as a, um, as a um, confirmation, the 14th of August, a confirmation that this Yorktown campaign was possible. And so around 9,000 men from Continental and French Army had to be moved from this point in Newport, uh, in New, around New York to Virginia over a distance of more than 500 miles. And so this was a very complicated mission because it had to be in sort of concert with all these different troops that had to arrive at the same time. The fleet of the Grasse had to arrive. The other fleet based in Newport had to arrive. So this was quite the logistical feast, we could say. And so they would leave on a, uh, the, the French American armies I'm talking about would leave in August. And so um, after a few weeks, while the troops marched between Philadelphia and Baltimore, Washington invited Rochambeau and Châtelieu, along with other French and American officers they worked with to his home in Mount Vernon. And so Washington's return marked the first time he had stepped foot in Mount Vernon, so his own home, after more than six years of absence, being, of course, the general of the Continental Army. And here the commanders discussed the strategic and logistical plans of the siege and battle of Yorktown that would follow. But especially on September 11th, Washington returned the hospitality that Châtelieu had given him in Newport in March. And so they enjoyed an excellent supper accompanied by Washington's favorite wine, Madeira in his beautiful green dining room. And so Jonathan Trumbull, the colonel, noted that the men were received with great appearance of opulence and real exhibitions of hospitality and even princely entertainment. 
And so Washington and his wife, I'm sure, have made compliments to the French and American officers at their table to toast on their cooperation, on the rapid advancement of their troops and their decision of actually going to Yorktown, but of course, especially to success in defeating the British. And so by way of um, oh, conclusion, of course, another point of the W3R is of course, Mount Vernon, George Washington's home, still visible today. So as a conclusion um, in historiography, so what has been written about this specific subject to this day, some historians claim that Washington was inspired by divine providence or that he was inspired, um, well, by his, his own ideas to go to Yorktown. But most historians would acknowledge um, the importance of the French officers in this decision, especially the input of George Washington, uh, sorry, of Rochambeau and de Grasse. According to most narratives, Rochambeau influenced or even manipulated George Washington into going to Yorktown based on his um, military experience um, and just his sort of more realistic approach. Um, and at the same time, it's also an, another kind of account that Admiral de Grasse himself had sailed to the Chesapeake Bay on his own initiative, thus forcing Washington and Rochambeau to also go there. But yet, I would say these accounts miss two important aspects. First, these documents that I discussed today show that the decision-taking process took much longer than is recognized, not just based on these three figures. There were much, many more people involved and they did this reconnaissance mission in the winter and then another one during the summer. Um, and so that is the first one, but also there are some other people involved, such as La Luzerne and Châtelieu, that were uh, very actively involved in this decision-making process. Um, and so I would say especially that it's, it's not an opposition between Washington and Rochambeau. Um, based on this new information, we can say that it's more a cooperation from the start. They were both considering the two options, plan A and a plan B, and by observing as much as they could, as gathering intelligence as much as they could, but also just basing themselves on the reality of their situation with a real lack of men. And so they kind of had to improvise uh, on spot on what to do, but they could prepare that very well too. And so there was a plan A and plan B prepared for long months. And so they made a rational and realistic decision. And so I would say Washington is not as stubborn as is often thought, and Rochambeau not that manipulative as, as is often portrayed, but they cooperated uh, on planning the most successful uh, operation or mission uh, with the modest means that they had on hand. And we can also see that François Jean Châtelieu, the interpreter or liaison officer, uh, was one of the people making this cooperation possible. He was especially sort of responsible to create unity between the two different armies and the want of them to trust each other enough to make such a big decision together. And so that was um, my lecture today. And I would be very happy to, to uh, answer your questions, um, and especially because, of course, um, I'm making quite some statements based on this new report. So I would be very happy to, to discuss that. Thank you very much. Um, so maybe you can or type or just, um, uh, I would be also very happy if, if we can talk just on the, if you can reactivate the microphones and then we can actually have a, uh, a dis discussion would be great. Even with images so that I can see you, it would be even more fun. Um, Iris, um, I had a question. Um, Hi. <laughs> Hi, Iris. Um, that was a great, great, great presentation. Um, Thank you. I, I was a little confused only because I didn't, I don't think I heard all the parts. Mm -hmm. And that is in April when you were talking about Chateau being told to tell Washington, but not to have Washington tell that he knew? I mean, I, I just, if you could go over that little exchange um, again. Um, that yeah, I went over that very quickly because yeah, there was a, so I went very quickly over that, it's true. And so there, it's all about some letters that they're writing um, and um, sort of the information that arrived from uh, at La Luzerne, so the ambassador in Philadelphia um late april and then uh there was an explicit sentence saying 
don't tell Washington that we're going to bring the, the big fleet of the grass because that information, if that leaks, it's too dangerous. And so uh, he writes La Luzerne, so the ambassador writes to Le Châtelieu privately, uh, can you please communicate the information to Washington because he just needs to know. And so this, there are a few letters like this that have, there's even been an intercepted, in, intercepted, yeah, letter uh, that the British got at the end. So it became quite a scandal, but it, he, uh, so Châtelieu sent some fake letters and also one real letter to Washington in which he announced, okay, the gas is coming. We have to organize ourselves. Let's start to plan. Uh, but this was contrary to what the king had ordered again. So this was all quite secret. And uh, Châtelieu writes to his sister, uh, and, because he writes a lot to his sister with what he'd done. And he said he had secret meetings with George Washington about it too. So apparently they had seen each other just before uh, the, the Weathersfield conference, or maybe even during, or I don't know, somewhere in the back in the corner, but they would discuss these matters secretly. Okay. Complicated <laughs> set of yeah. don't tell, do tell, who told. Who exactly. It's, yeah, it's complicated to, to really reconstruct, especially because um, one of the main things is what happened, you can see, is that they were sending fake letters to be intercepted, and then it's hard to to decipher which one is fake and which one is the real one. So it's a, an interesting investigation. <laughs> Thank you. I had my hand up to ask the question, uh, how far ahead of the troops were the uh, um, people from the um, supplies standpoint? Uh, one would think it would be easy for the British to pick up the movement of the troops by the movement of the um, people securing supplies ahead of time and also uh, securing the boats so that they would be available for the troops. Yes, that, that's true. And it, it, that was one of the main challenges is to, uh, this was mainly, so the one where they were transporting everyone to New York, so the first leg of the, the the route that is today called Washington Rochambeau route, but of course, um, so the route they walked, uh, that was not that secret, but the second phase was supposed to be kept quite secret, especially at the beginning, because everything was about to go as rapid as they could without being stopped by the British. And so there were lots of tricks they would put in place, such as creating fake bread ovens, they would create fake ships, everything to make believe that they would do that. But so the question is how far ahead were they? And um, there's um, a document that I have studied quite in depth of uh, Mathieu Dumas was the major, no, sorry, the aide de camp, aide de camp of Rochambeau. And he would go about, let's say a week ad in advance all the time to prepare everything. So he would prepare the roads, he would prepare the logistics, um, but it is true that it's always been a bit sort of complicated to understand how the British did not know. And if you start to read the British letters, you can find that they did know that they were on the move, but they just didn't react accordingly. They didn't react quickly enough to stop them. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. One of the decoys that uh, the, uh, the Washington used was to have uh, bread ovens built uh, in Chatham, New Jersey. And mm -hmm. it, was, uh, it was the French army that built those ovens and they made a big deal out of getting bricks from a long distance away to make it look like they were going to take a, a long time to be there. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Washington's army was in Philadelphia by the time the British realized that uh, this was a decoy and it was too late for them to act. Yes, <laughs> thank you. That's very true. And it's interesting to see all these diversion actions because they, as I said, there were lots of letters to, there were some spies that were sent to misinform. So it was a large operation to kind of hide such a big movement of troops. Iris, uh, I don't know if you can hear me. I don't, I'm not really good with this technology, can you? Yes, I can. Hello. <laughs> I'm an 18th century guy. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I, I remember being at the Beinecke Library at Yale and reading actual letters between Washington and Rochambeau um, in, I think it was, the period was June. Yes. Uh, and in those letters, it seemed to me that Washington was urging Rochambeau and the letters were sent every day, the next day mm -hmm. and the next mm -hmm. day and the next mm -hmm. day to kind of get the French uh, decamped and to get started. 
And yes. I was wondering about that tension that may have existed at that moment between the, the two generals. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I would say there, there was quite some tension and you can especially feel that in the French letters that Rochambeau and his staff are sending to themselves and there are especially some comments of the younger officers that are commenting on Rochambeau that he is so stubborn and that he just doesn't want to listen to, to others and to advice of others um, and so that he is too slow in reacting but then others would say he's very prudent because they have to wait for, for their new troops. Um, and Washington urging for that too. So you could see that there was quite some tension and at the same time, um, overall, it really seems that they were working together on, on just making the best possible campaign. Again, with the mean, they just didn't have the means so they were waiting. Um, and I'm sure that Washington at one point got quite frustrated. There are some letters about that too, that he's like, why are they not doing anything? So there is frustration. But there's also a lot of frustration on the French side. So every, everyone's getting very impatient for action. Um, so you, you can could, really- you, you, could, you could sense that. And also you yeah. talked about diversionary letters. Mm -hmm. I noticed in a lot of the letters that I saw uh, at the Beinecke, they mm -hmm. were using the secret coded numbers and mm -hmm. you can actually mm -hmm. see the letters that were sent to Rochambeau and how his translator uh, translated the actual amount, the actual, um, the actual secret coding. He, he translated it. Of course, it's in French and it's written mm -hmm. between the lines. But uh, you know, they were using coded numbers. Yes, exactly. Lots of it's 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 funny because uh, last week I was in an archive that I I'd never been to. That is a sort of a huge new collection, and there were lots of these coded letters, and they're very interesting to read because most of all they have been deciphered by someone else. So you can read all these secret messages. Um, for the Yorktown campaign, especially. Yeah, but I feel that especially this impatience and especially Washington still really hopes to go to New York. And you just, that is true. And they're really preparing that that too. But at the end, they just can't do it. And everyone is, I think, quite sad about it. But at the same time, they plan on, that's also quite interesting, just after Yorktown, they plan on actually starting a new attack on New York because they that's what they actually want to do. And then out of a sudden, it's a surrender. And out of a sudden, peace talks are starting. So I think it's also in their heads, it's like, let's do a, sort of an alternative small campaign and then the actual blow will come later, uh, but they didn't have to anymore. Thank you, well done, by the way. Thank you very much. Good to see you again too, by the way. Madam. <laughs> yes. Iris, you have some questions in the chat box. Ah, okay, I didn't see that yet. Um, ah, here we go. Uh, is there anything about the crossing of the Hudson River in the letters? Um, so that's of course very close to the this whole Odell House and the different um, uh, New York. Uh, so the, the after this, um, the the reconnaissance tour in New York. What happened after, of course, is this crossing of the Hudson is quite a big episode. And there was even just before uh, the reconnaissance tour on the 15th of July, there was sort of a battle up there too. Um, and there, not, so in the Chateau letters, there's not much about it, but I just have come across a new collection of archives uh, of the Viomenil, so the Baron de Viomenil. And there is a lot of information about that in them, but I haven't had the time to look at it yet because it's it's been about five days that I, I know of the existence of that whole archive. So uh, I can talk about that in the next lecture if, if someone's interested in that, but um, for now, I, I don't know that much about it. Um, and so there is another question, what was Lafayette's role? Um, so that's quite the broad question, the role I think in, in this whole um, campaign. So he was sent um, to the south, uh, as we have seen at one point in uh, in March during this battle uh, that is relating to the Chesapeake Bay. He was there fighting, and so it's um, his role was especially that he kept the the British where they had to be, so that the French and the American armies could walk as fast as they could uh, to the different, um, to, so to the Chesapeake Bay and surroundings. And so he was, especially his role is to keep them there. Another role he had at the beginning of the campaign was to be the interpreter between Rochambeau and Washington, but he was quickly sent away because um, according to Rochambeau, he had done some transgressions 
uh, by by kind of obliging them to to immediately take action and go to New York. So he was put aside and sent to the south mainly for that. Um, and then for the rest, um, I found quite an interesting letter of, of Lafayette when he was in the South uh, fighting against, especially Phillips, and then um, he was fighting against, uh, of course, um, what's the name, so Cornwallis. And he wrote to Châtelieu about that, um, that he was very afraid. I'm trying to look, the, look up the quote, but I don't know where it is now. But um, so he was writing to his uncle Châtelieu that he was, had received this function of, of a major general in the army of Washington, but that he, he had devilish fear and felt devilish embe uh, embarrassment having that high rank because he had no experience in that. And he would especially say that while Phillips was there, um, it was not that, not that much of a fear for him because he said that Phillips was always drunk so that was fine, but then when just when uh, Cornwallis came to the theater, he became very afraid and just trembled by the idea of a new, of a new, um, new battle. So I thought that letter was quite interesting because it's not really that heroic role you can always uh, hear about. But anyway, I'm not sure I, I am replying the, to the question of John Sauer on what was Lafayette's role because there's just he had a a very important role, especially so to keep the forces in the South so that the, the actual attack could happen. And then there's another announcement that there's a virtual birthday celebration for Rochambeau on July the 1st. So that would be an interesting thing maybe to all celebrate his birthday. <laughs> okay, so are there any other questions? I think so it's pretty it, quiet here, Iris. Yeah, it's very, it's very quiet yeah. again. I heard a little bird, so that was nice. But <laughs> thank you so much for uh, for your time this evening. This was very informative. I know I learned a lot, and I, I know our participants learned a lot too. So thank you so much for for uh, being here for us this evening. I know it's almost midnight there where you're at, and yeah, um, it's very, very hot in in this room. So I'm very happy to open the windows again. <laughs> Yeah, for, for all of our uh, participants, Iris informed me that they do not have air conditioning where she's at. So, uh, so um, uh, I found that interesting. So, but anyways, uh, thank you so much. Almost, it's almost a cultural difference between France and the U.S. Because in the U.S. there's always air conditioning up until the point it's somewhere too cold, I would even say. But uh, here there's just no air conditioning, especially not in old buildings such as where I live. So um, it can become very hot in summer. <laughs> Um, anyway, thank you very well, much. Well, thank you so and, much. Um, and next time I'll talk about the the march to Yorktown, so the final stage before the battle with uh, other unpublished accounts. So I hope you'll be there then again. Bye-bye. <laughs>